thank you so much for checking out the WeVA podcast. Today I'm here with Maximilian Work, Engineering Director at Gina AI. We're going to talk about all sorts of things related to Gina AI's full stack neural search solution. It's such an interesting software. We've been publishing blog posts and tutorials of how to integrate WeVA with Gina AI. And there are just so many interesting components of this. So I'm super excited to get right into it. So I think a great uh, way to tip off uh, our podcast would be to talk about uh, the ecosystem of Gina AI, uh, how you tackle neural search problems and the general philosophy behind it. Hey, Connor, thanks for having me uh, here and give me the chance to talk about uh, Gina and uh, how we tackle neural search. So as Han already mentioned last time, uh, we have several components inside Gina. So um, I think the first thing that you will come and touch is the Docker array which somehow is our tool for massaging data and somehow loading your data into a format that Gina understands and then all parts of the ecosystem can handle. You can think of it a little bit like NumPy array where you put your data and then you can do all the crazy stuff either with NumPy or SciPy. And it's somewhat the same here. We have a data format. Um, and the reason why we didn't talk NumPy in the first place is because um, in search you have unstructured data and uh, different data types. And um, we needed some structure to know, okay, where is what? Um, and uh, also optimize it for network transport. So um, yeah, the, the, this is the Docker array, the first part. Then I already talked about network transport. So we have our Gina, we call it internally Gina core, which um, is the main package um, that you also find usually. Um, and there we care about all the nasty stuff that you don't want to care about. So network uh, communication, uh, deploying Docker images somewhere where your nice code is inside. Um, making sure that when you don't want to deploy Docker images, but run locally, that you also can just run locally without always having the whole uh, several Docker images spin up. Um, so yeah, this is what core takes about. So all the infrastructure, also Kubernetes, uh, how to uh, deploy to Kubernetes and things that you just want to, especially as an ML engineer, you don't want to care about. Um, <laughs> <laughs> then we have the Gina Hub, um, and I already talked about the executor, uh, or briefly mentioned some of the executors, and the executors somehow are the working tools that we have, and um, so whenever you have your custom code, you put it into an executor, and these um, and we want people also to share the executors. So for example, we have a clip executor where you can use a clip either for image or text uh, as an encoder, and we want this to be shareable because we believe in this social aspect that uh, people can use other people's code. Uh, Gina itself is open source. So uh, we like the idea that uh, you can share it via the Gina Hub, but you don't have to. So if you have your private custom executor for your application, or potentially even business knowledge is inside, you don't want to share it. So you can also upload it to our Hub without making it public and just have it in your somehow under your own supervision. And um, in the long run, this hopefully, uh, or currently we are developing also uh, more features for this hub, which makes then really a communication uh, platform where people can communicate and also use more uh, services of uh, that we will offer hopefully pretty soon. Yeah, that's yeah. the hub. Yeah, the Gina hub was so, is so interesting. I, I've been loving learning more about it. And it, it, it reminds me of, say, uh, like GitHub, but I love how it's also like hosted microservices and you can query these microservices on the Gina hub. But if we could kind of step into the executor and, uh, and just to increase my understanding of, and hopefully people listening's understanding of how executors put operations on document arrays and how flows kind of orchestrate the connection between executors. And so the first question I want to ask is about the kind of functions you're applying on your, doc on your document array in the executor. So are most of these functions already contained in the document uh, array objects? So similar to NumPy array arrays, uh, document arrays, they have built-in functions. So, uh, you know, if you're saying uh, document array.embed or document array.find or, uh, you know, the neural information retrieval metrics, is it mostly about orchestrating the calls to the document array and putting them into an executor object and then wrapping that up, sending it to the network layer? Yeah, I would say so when you develop it locally, then you just have to exactly this call to the document array and perhaps then you also load your model and then you call the model. And uh, the executors are exactly about, okay, putting these steps into something that is rerunnable somewhere where you want to put it in either cloud or on your server or wherever you want to put it. Um, and uh, yeah, you don't need to care about this wrapping yourself too much, especially all this network mm -hmm. communication. This is then taken away from you. Um, 
and the document array itself, you'd somehow you ask, okay, what, what functions do we have there? So we have a lot of, um, I personally use a lot this helper function. So when I want to uh, embed images, they first need to have a certain format and so on. And I I'm always forget about how to do this. And then there's just this function, okay, scale me this to the right thing, do the right things here. And then usually it just works underneath, which I'm personally super happy because uh, I never can remember how these functions are called in any other packages and which package or how I do it. And um, so we have a lot of helper functions, especially for image preprocessing, but also <laughs> quick data and some more um, understanding functions. Um, them you might not put into an executor, but all this data massaging, for example, as a preprocessor, you can put in front of your uh, model in order to have the right format. When user just sent your query as an image, you need mm -hmm. to transform it in the correct format. And um, for example, this you can put in executor, but whatever you do on, on your Docker array, you can somehow put in there. And um, we, we try to do it like the executor itself has not much, or our, our executor that we give you, that you then use subclass from has no um, let's say business logic. So it, it, there's it's no smartness. Whatever you want to do with an executor, you need to do yourself. Uh, but uh, it somehow it really focuses on keeping away the pain. Whereas when you want to do things there, then you do it on the Docker array. This is exactly what you described before. There you do your uh, operations on the Docker array. Yeah, and I, I love the pre-processing uh, part of the Gina Hub. I think it's so interesting the way that you take, say, a big image and then you either, uh, probably the most naive solution is to put a sliding window across it and then put each of those chunks into its own tensor and its own, uh, as you have that nested and hierarchical structure. And for people listening, I love this nested structure of the Gina Doc array that lets you go uh, define matches as well as define segments of these objects. So say you're searching through a scientific paper, you can segment it into abstract introduction related works and, and you can easily have this kind of hierarchical embeddings. And that's one of the most my favorite parts about uh, Gina and the things that I've been learning from uh, talking to Han and going through the documentation is I love this hierarchical I've, I've, embedding. So and then we you... just re released a new feature. Let me just uh, hook in there. So besides <laughs> this hierarchical embedding, we also use this internally to have this multimodal document, which allows you to store text and image somehow at the same time in a document, which was not easily doable beforehand, but somehow then natively use both of them, which is uh, really, uh, let's say you have a PDF that you want to search on, then you might want to sometimes scan the or search on the image space mm -hmm. and have no text page or space or both together. And so, um, or if you just think about any e-commerce application. So usually when you go to a shop, you always have a description of your product and the text. And potentially you want to search on both. And this is where we use also this hierarchical structure in a way that um, you uh, can have both uh, or multiple um, modalities at the same time in one document. Uh, but you don't feel it. It's underneath hidden mm -hmm. and you somehow, you just use it as it uh, would be one. So that's pretty cool new feature. We just released, I don't know, a week ago or so. Yeah, that's just so fascinating, the adding the images and text search to searching through documents, whether it's papers, legal documents, I don't know how many pictures are in legal documents, but, <laughs> but this kind of thing. And <laughs> and uh, and maybe like tables also, that kind of thing for mm -hmm. papers especially. But um, one thing I'm curious about is how well do these kind of pre-processing executors when they're uh, you know wrapped up in that kind of executor logic, how well do these generalize to the hub? So uh, maybe to give a a couple examples. If you have, say, an object detection model that's pre-trained and it's a part of the executor and the object det detection model uh, parses the images, chunks them, say, we found a basketball, we found shoes, <laughs> and it designs the, uh, the overall document object that way. Or, or maybe you have a PDF parser and uh, that generalizes to, uh, you know, it can chunk up any text and separate the images. Is that kind of the vision for how these pre-processing functions hosted on Gina Hub generalize to all sorts of applications? Yes, I think that, that yeah, this is a very good point. So I think um, this is what we want. We want somehow to solve an all kind of application, but I think it's um, naive to think we have this one segmenter that segments text and images and then boom, we're done and everybody can just segment their PDFs. Uh, so um, <laughs> What I see personally, that this usually, someone have this generalized uh, chunker that does then all the magic is kind of hard, mm -hmm. but you rather have um, certain use cases. Like, okay, for PDFs, I have perhaps one chunker that does this, but this does just PDF. It, you will have a hard time to do this at the same time for a PDF than for, I don't know, what could else could it be? Uh, the Office document where you do that. So and, um, my vision is that <laughs> for the different use cases, um, you have different executors that can be, um, 
yeah, are specialized and then you need this, this social sharing because um, developing one of these executors may take you several days and to really make it bug free it takes you potentially weeks mm. let's be honest that's the case right whenever you want to do make a software really good it takes you quite some time and um, not everybody has the resources and I believe uh, in neural search the, the problem currently is that in order to solve one neural search application you can do everything yourself but you will it will take a considerable of, amount of time to make a product out of it. And um, when you look at traditional search, there you have some more ecosystem which is, has grown over years, uh, over one and a half decades or so, mm -hmm. in order to give you all the features that you need. And the features are well proved, and a lot of people worked on them and uh, tested them and know, okay, they work. In a neural search um, uh, or any emerging technology, um, you need this a lot of parts, try them out. A lot of the executors in the hub will just fail and nobody will use them again. Mm -hmm. That's just. I mean, life, right? Uh, mm -hmm. But some of them will be good and they will somehow stay. And I think the hub is some kind of a, also place where this um, new ideas happen. And sometimes something is really good, a little bit like an open source repository, uh, where mm -hmm. sometimes they are good. Then you have another one, which is a little bit better in usability and all of a sudden it raises much higher. And I think in the hub, you will have similar um, behavior. And um, so uh, I, I believe there won't be generalized executors to just do everything, but rather specialized ones. And then when you have your use case, um, people wrote a tutorial somewhere else, and then you know, okay, I can use this one because someone else really explained me how I can use this, and then I can use this in a good way. But don't have to write it myself. So I perhaps need still half a day to understand really what happens, but not four weeks to make a production ready. So this is then already you save three weeks, four days, and some hours. Uh, and uh, I think this is the way how... Uh, new search must grow that you build a lot of components and this is also what we do in gina in general um, that we try out okay let's solve a new problem and then see where do we fail <laughs> usually we always <laughs> fail somewhere but it's not that uh, so it gets better but still we fail somewhere and then we see oh this is what something that we need to solve or we see oh look we failed in implementing our own indexer uh, oh not completely failed but not made it perfect with all the replication and the nasty stuff that comes when you do databases and oh but we wait is there let's let's use them <laughs> let's somehow uh, see where we can partner up and um somehow when it's a really hard problem um it, i think it doesn't make sense to try to solve everything yourself but find your partners mm -hmm. and um mm -hmm. yeah this is how we do it and i believe this is how neural search can only grow yeah and, and i'm really excited to get more into uh partners and understand more of the integrations uh, really quickly, I just want to stay a little more on this general end-to-end -end framework. And and yeah, you mentioned uh, there's there are all these different components, and they're very flexible, modular, and and you can rotate them in and out for your application case. And so I've been thinking about generally this kind of theme of say fine-tuning adaptation with these uh, parametric models, and you know whether you have an embedding API that's been trained on internet text, and now you want to fine-tune it on biomedical papers, or you want to fine-tune it on e-commerce products, and it was trained on you know, just internet image text pairs. Do you think maybe in the pre-processing layer, the segmenter could be, should be a parametric function? So some are doing natural language processing, how they train, say, named entity recognition models, and they try to like label, this is the most salient, or say like um, in computer vision, you famously have things like rad cam where they highlight, like, this is the head of the elephant. This is the most salient part of the image. Do you think we should maybe fine tune these kind of segmenters as well for particular applications? To be honest, I don't know. Uh, so I haven't worked with an application where we had this somehow uh, segmenting part. But uh, mm -hmm. I think, yes, this at some at some point you will uh, run exactly this problem. I'm not sure how good. So what I understand when you have the segmenting, for example, in, in self-driving cars, this works already pretty good on images that you see. Okay, this is this, mm -hmm. especially uh, when you have uh, Self-driving uh, cars have a quite kind of narrow domain, so you need to identify people and other cars and mm -hmm. static objects. So it's a kind of um, already predefined domain, and there it's solved already. But yes, you're right. It might be that <laughs> for, for other use cases, we exactly also need to um, train these parts in our pipeline. And then um, not all, currently we, we have never, or I have never thought about fine-tuning this, but absolutely right. Um, this makes sense. And I, I'm really excited to get into the general topic of the Gina AI fine tuner. And I think it's such an important part of this ecosystem. But uh, one more question I wanted to ask you about uh, Gina Hub and the executors is, um, so well, I actually have two. The first of which is, um, so with with the executor logic, if, I'm, if I want to implement my own custom kind of processing on a document array, where is it? Would I, be, would I be able to just have to have like a for loop where I'm looping through it? How does it say vectorize it and parallelize it? 
Is that a, kind of a native thing to define some operation on a document and then wrap it into an executor? Uh, yes, so uh, the, the uh, executor itself has the um, function, I think it's called apply. Um, yeah, so we actually have the new apply function, which we also implemented some weeks ago, uh, which allows you to um, have a document array and just say, okay, do with this, with every document here the following, and then this apply function uh, does the job for you. And it also, uh, as far as I understand, it cares about um, parallelizing it out, fanning it out, and making it really fast. And um, yeah, so that's out of, possible out of the box. Yeah, yeah, I'm really excited to hear that. I, with my code, I've seen so many cases where I've switched like a for loop to a NumPy vectorization and the difference could be like 40 minutes to 10 seconds when, when that kind of changed. So, so it's really interesting for me to hear about that apply function and add that to my understanding. So one other question I have about the general philosophy of Gina Hub is are, are the executor functions, are they private? If I contribute a Gina Hub and is this viewed as say my product, I'm like a company and I'm, I'm pushing this Gina Hub executor. Is this my product and my code is private or is it open sharing of the code of the executor that's pushed on Gina Hub? However you want. So uh, you, you can decide. And if it's openly push, pushed, um, we only do this via you push your code to GitHub and tell us here's the GitHub repository usually. And um, so um, I think you can also just push the code, but we encourage highly to also um, show this is the repository because this will also build trust with people, right? Uh, seeing, uh, being able to uh, go to the code underneath and uh, check, okay, is this doing something weird on my machines or is it actually doing what I expect it to do? Mm -hmm. um, while not too many people might want to do this, I think it's a general good idea to have this uh, because some people go in there and will find malicious stuff. And uh, mm -hmm. this is always a problem, right? When you have a hub, mm -hmm. someone can put you something underneath. So we encourage to um, <laughs> include the code in a, uh, as a GitHub repository whenever an executor is public. But you can also just push it and get the private executor and then use it privately, and but use the same infrastructure. So you push your code still, but you get Docker images also in different Gina versions, which might be not so obvious feature, but um, when we have a new Gina version and uh, if you want to use the same executor, you just can say, oh, I use a new Gina version and you get another Docker image with a new later Gina version, mm -hmm. um, which is, Seems like, um, yeah, okay, perhaps that makes sense or not, but uh, we had big problems with this version control of different versions of the whole ecosystem, mm -hmm. different parts of the ecosystem, and then also people having their individual executors. This this can be quite a pain. And uh, so we want to take away also this pain from you. And mm -hmm. why the hub looks, <laughs> for, if you look at it, it's like, yeah, okay, I download some code and package it to Docker image, which, which is there, there's a Docker file. So what is, what is the magic here? But there is um, quite some, mad, some things and in the moment you put things into production, you would feel the pain and we take it away. <laughs> yeah, it's fascinating. I imagine, uh, yeah, I remember Han talking about the infrastructure layer and having things like push notifications for when you need to update one of your uh, executors in the Gina hub and overall kind of the, the flow of versioning and that under the hood stuff that makes a marketplace kind of uh, business come to life. And, and it, yeah, as, as you're talking about, say, the security concerns, I was thinking about how easy it would be to, say, add another layer where you have a uh, maybe some kind of cybersecurity model that takes even like a text representation of the code and tries to classify if there are problems, maybe something like that. But, but like the modularity of it is pretty extensible to add that kind of virus scanning layer onto the infrastructure of Gina Hub. So yeah, I don't see that as being something that would um, mm -hmm. be too problematic. <laughs> it's just kind of taking people's functions and just adding it to your database potentially, right? Could be <laughs> not good. <Yep. laughs> <laughs> so yeah, um, so, so kind of mm -hmm. the next question, and I think it comes also, this is about the network layer that wraps this. And I think the design of the at requests uh, tagging, and then you have the paths, I think it's pretty straightforward how you do that. Uh, you just kind of specify the pass and then it has that kind of sequential flow where uh, I think when it exits, it'll it'll just um, call the next path. Is that correct? Do they share like a file system, so to say, where, or is it all about passing data from one executor or one wrapped executor to the next one? Yes, it's all, uh, they don't share any file system. So the idea is the executors can in principle live on completely different machines, data, even different data centers. So it's mm -hmm. possible that you have, uh, when you experiment, for example, you have your local executors, which does the easy stuff, but then you want to um, encode 10,000 images with a clip and image encoder, and you don't have a good GPU on your laptop, then you might have an issue, but you can still use an external executor. So um, the whole um, 
at request logic that we have in our executors is purely for understanding uh, when you glue the executors together in your flow definition. Um, when you call which endpoint, which other end, which endpoint should be called at the executor. So the easiest example here is the um, indexer. So sometimes you write data and sometimes you search. And uh, usually when you already call the API at the very beginning of the flow of the gateway, you know, okay, I call the, um, I want to index data or I want to search it, but you rarely want to do both or never. And so they already specify, I want to index now. And then all executors in the flow know, okay, I need to do whatever I need to do during indexing. And it might be that you have, for example, um, you talked about indexers, uh, segmenters before. Mm -hmm. And the segmenter might also have two different uh, segmenting functions, one for indexing, there you get PDFs, so you need to do the PDF magic and get images and text out of it. And the other one might be uh, segmenting just for user input, which might be just pure images. And you want to search for only people in these images, find them in PDFs, random example. And mm -hmm. then you, the, the segmenter would get the faces or the whatever you need to identify people. I honestly have never worked with <laughs> image recognition or a people recognition, but uh, as an example, somehow when you uh, want this, then the segmenter must do something else. But it might be that you can actually use the same segmenter because both is image segmentation. So you just have the logic a little bit different for these two functions. And then you can do this for all your executors. You can define, okay, in this pathway, you do this. And then the other pathway, you do the other thing. And then they, um, you don't need to build two executors to do this, but just one executor that does both. And this one executor also lives on one machine, which for the segmenter is neglectable. Segmenter doesn't care. But the indexer, uh, when you index something, and it saves it locally in the machine in the state, and you want to search, can't be another executor because it should be on the same machine. Because executors are, um, two instances of executors are always uh, share no state with each other. Hmm. So and as such, they, uh, um, when you have the search in the index, they must happen in the same executor and you can't just say, I have two of them. So, uh, so, and I'm sorry if I'm understanding this incorrectly, but so if you call an indexer, you would have to put the other executor on the same machine as the indexer rather than say, uh, like writing the indexer to a database or like some kind of layer like that. And then multiple executors access that memory. Is that... Uh, so, so yeah, when you have the indexers, uh, either it saves the state locally, then somehow you need the index and the search function on the same local mm -hmm. storage because it saves it locally. Or you, they have a shared space, as, uh, or they, they have some database underneath which they call where the index uh, the indexer is more or less just the API layer. Um, then multiple of them can share the same database. Okay. And is this kind of the general philosophy behind like microservice architecture? I think like functional programming, is that the correct kind of general uh, design pattern of this? Yes, yes. So so having, um, hmm. So let, let me talk a little bit about the history, how we came there. It might be confusing, but I think it's, it's uh, interesting to, to see this example, how, how things developed. So this whole thing is called the flow because um, originally we had something like a, like a circular network. So you send your traffic to one executor and then to the next one, to the next one, to the next one. And at some point it uh, came back to the gateway and then returns the answer. This was our initial idea. And um, there you somehow, um, ah, I lost, uh, what, what do I want to say? What was the question again? There was a <laughs> I, I mentioned uh, the the uh, microservice architecture, the... Uh... Right, right. Okay. Uh, when you have this flow, this is not really a microservice. Uh, it, it's kind of microservice, but it was connected via zero MQ. So um, not really what you see as, okay, I have microservices APIs, but uh, yeah, not, not really what how you traditionally see a microservice, perhaps. And But we, we found, okay, this is kind of nice because you uh, have as few network hops as possible. Mm -hmm. But at some point we figured out, okay, network hops might be, that might be preliminary optimization. And we rather want to have one central and then somehow ask the executors one after the other, like a, like a star somehow. Mm -hmm. uh, and then every executor is like a microservice because you just ask a question and you get a response. You ask the next one and get a response. And exactly, then you have them encapsulated as microservices, uh, which you uh, call one after the other. So is that, um, I think they call that the master slave architecture where there's the, um, the center node and it sends up the, um, the requests and Mm, yeah, but master slave is somehow when you have databases and they somehow all share a common state more, let's say, uh, mm. share some some knowledge and then you somehow have one that has the knowledge. But here it's more like, uh, um, 
a central somehow node. Uh, it's not a node master. It's just a central node that it asks different services. So the first service is a segment, a segmenter. Okay, get me segmenter mm -hmm. back. Or a second service is um, indexer. Get me indexing back. Third service is okay, lock some information wherever you want. Get this back. And then the last service is perhaps another indexer because you want to index the something else. And uh, so it's it's more um, like a central gateway. It's also it's called gateway. Uh, some mm -hmm. gateway which gets the traffic and then distributes it where it should go. And, and so once it orchestrates the distribution, it flows sequentially around the executors? Is that yes, but, but always back to the gateway somehow. It, it comes always back. But without uh, writing data to the center node. So it sends its data that it's returned to the next executor node in the like if this is the center and then we get a circle around it <laughs> no 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 it always sends back so what you described just was how it was before but this mm -hmm. has several disadvantages if you have this uh, how it was before then um and somewhere uh, an error happens you uh, uh, need to either propagate this error through all the consecutive executors <laughs> or you directly need to return the error to the gateway and mm -hmm. um there are a lot of, uh, when you have this, this, this circle flow, a lot of features that you have in modern micro architecture, uh, microservices or microservice architecture that you can't use and which are just not possible. Um, scaling itself gets complicated because you need in front of every single um, executor, you need somehow another mini gateway in order to scale or mm -hmm. uh, especially since we say that they can be anyhow anywhere in the world let's so uh, if one executor sends the next one but the one is local at my machine and the other one is somewhere in the world then it might be scaled with five replicas then mm -hmm. i locally need to understand where are these five uh, replicas or i need a gateway in front of these five re replicas and the whole network architecture gets much more complicated when we don't have the central uh, instance with somehow know everything about the, the architecture that we have here and then can um, communicate this and, and, cool. and at some point the central instance the gateway uh, i think uh, to be honest i'm not even sure if we can already replicate it on if we can it but it's pretty uh, soon planned that we also can re uh, scale this one because um, when you have just one entry node and you can replicate everything else for failure but not the entry node you have the same problem again and so all mm -hmm. the, also this should be scalable and then all of these uh, entry nodes have somehow have an understanding of the whole architecture Super cool. And um, so Gina has these six great examples right after you go through the intermediate boot camp where you uh, go through the course of executor and, and flow and uh, these tutorials for people listening uh, in the text domain, you have fuzzy string matching, question answering chatbot and open domain question answering on long, long documents and images. You have image to image search, search images from text and search small images inside large images. Do you think we could walk through, say, the open domain question answering on long documents? to get a sense of the end-to-end -end Gina system. So maybe we start off with our uh, collection of documents. We apply our segmenter to each document. Uh, then we apply the embedding algorithm. Then we apply the HNSW index. And then we kind of, uh, we, maybe we have a re-ranking layer. And then we have our uh, question answering layer. Could you help me understand how, how that then comes into the flow and the executor pattern? Sure. Uh, let me walk you through this uh, to the open domain question answering uh, guide that we have. Um, first, perhaps a small disclaimer. I'm not sure if this is the perfect way to solve this problem, but it should still t uh, show you how you can uh, in solve a, tackle such a problem and how to use the Gina component. So don't, don't expect it to be the perfect answer to the uh, or the latest state of the art uh, answer to how to do open domain question answering, but rather, yeah, understand the components of Gina. So if you uh, look at the diagrams that you see where you have the gateway, then the question generator, text encoder, and simple indexer. Um, you, this is our flow that we have in order to index our documents. So um, as I said before, when you uh, build your search engine, you always have, uh, usually have these two steps. First, you need to get your data that you want to search in, into the indexer, and then afterwards you want to search it. And um, here in this case, we built two flows, which do um, the steps individually. And um, so we want to answer questions on a big document. So someone, uh, let me explain short uh, what we want to do. So someone um, gives, has a big long document or perhaps even multiple long documents. And um, afterwards, you come with a question and want to directly jump in this long document to the right sentence and get the answer. And for this, uh, how one way to do this is that you uh, take this long document and um, break it down into paragraphs or sentences. And then you, uh, for each of these sentences, you formulate a question. 
in order to, uh, which would be answered by the sentence. And there are models in order to do exactly this somehow to um, f uh, formulate questions for a given answer. And in the later, when you search and you have a question, you actually just look at all the questions that you generated. Mm -hmm. hmm, where is my uh, somehow, uh, where's the nearest question to my question? And then just return the answer. Um, I think this is the, the progress uh, the, or the um, way we do it here. And um, let me double check if this is really true. Yes, OK, it's exactly the right uh, thing. Because uh, we had so many uh, approaches how to solve this problem, I was not sure if we really <laughs> do this approach as this example. <laughs> OK, and so, so the first thing that we do is um, we build our query flow. And here you see the gateway. And this is um, what, uh, why it's at the beginning and at the end. Because your user will interact with the gateway at the beginning once when you send the query. And at the end, the gateway will answer. So the, it, for you, it feels like the query is going around. What I explained before, actually, the query goes from the gateway to the questions generator, then back to the gateway, then to text decoder, then back to the gateway, then to symbol indexer, and then back to the gateway. But yes. for you, it doesn't matter. So from, from a conceptual thing, it's just, OK, it goes from one executed to the next one. And uh, so the flow is the, the complete uh, uh, graphic that you see from left to right. Then a single executor is one of these uh, teal boxes. So for example, the question generator. Um, is the is one executor, and in this question generator is the um, model that takes a sentence um, and predicts a query, um, a query that would be answered by the sentence, and the question generator itself also um, chunks down the document as far as I remember. So it also cares about um, having when you have a long document making it to shorter documents. So this takes care of both these things. And the next executor is the text encoder. Um, this then takes the question uh, that come in and encodes them into a vector space. So this is the first model, the question transformer, somehow is just for transforming or generating queries. And the second model is now for uh, generating us the vectors that we need for vector search. And then we use a simple indexer to store the uh, vectors inside the database. And the simple index are somehow a local database which you can easily use, which doesn't go anywhere in the cloud. You don't need, to, just needs a, a file pass and it just saves there. Stores data and you can retrieve it later on. So it's very convenient for uh, local experiments. Hmm. And so, so do you have any questions here uh, directly, Connor, about what, what uh, is what? Yeah, this, this, this looks great. And it, it's very clear to me how it flows. I, I guess like, and I'm sorry that I'm getting hung up on this. I bet maybe listeners also have already kind of understood this and I'm just a little behind. But so the, the gateway is the abstraction of the networking object. So is that correct? The gateway is the thing that's uh, just kind of contains the information about the sequential order of how to run things and where they're hosted. You know what? As a user, you don't care about the gateway. You never see it. <laughs> As a user, you just see the flow and you start something and then you have an API and you call the API and you don't care that there is a gateway. But yes, you're, the gateway is somehow the central piece that I talked about before. That's somehow where you can send your request to. And then mm -hmm. this takes uh, care that all the executors are uh, called in the right order. And when they're scaled also that the uh, traffic is distributed evenly uh, between different replicas of one executor and takes care about a lot of these uh, things and so um so are these executors so the flow or points to where they're hosted with their api endpoints and do you host these executors on different cloud services so say um my pre-processing is hosted on my local machine but then my uh document embedder where i'm running queries through a sentence transformer that lives on uh, gpu ec2 or something like that and then we come back to say uh some kind of host for the queries is, is it like so, so you post the executors each on different machines? Uh, yes, however you wish. Yes, you can host them all on the same machine. You can host them on a different machine. You can host them all in one Kubernetes cluster. You can even not host them at all. And we have the sandbox feature that I think you mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. where you just say, I want to use this executor from Gina. Please just use it. And then uh, in the moment you send traffic to us, we spin it up if it's not already spun up. And then you can just send queries. And after 50 minutes or so, or I'm not sure, uh, sometime it scales down mm. if you don't use it. But as long as you use it, you can just use and uh, use it. And currently, it's for free. So uh, you don't even have to uh, host the executor itself. So um, yeah, but in principle, that's exactly right. You can put them wherever you want. 
Yeah, we have a similar service with uh, the WeV8 cloud service that helps you do like a free sandbox of these cloud services. And I agree, I think it's so important for say integrating it with uh, like Google Collab and getting a quick sense of the networking layer and how to do that kind of thing. So, so that was super interesting and I love this tour let, let, of... Let me directly oh, yeah. go in here. So the, if you, for example, you have the simple indexer where I said, okay, this stores everything wherever the simple indexer lives. But you can also use um, um, somehow a WeV8 connector we get API, and this is just an executor, which whenever it gets, then the, would not index locally, but would exactly use this VVA cloud service and then send to this VVA mm-hmm. cloud service and it's stored there. And when you search, it would somehow uh, be also like an, a proxy for the VV8 uh, database. And then you can somehow, the query comes, uh, the query also goes to VV8 and the result is returned back. And then you somehow use Gina as an orchestration layer around VV8, uh, but uh, use the, the power of the database itself um, in the VV8 cloud, for example. Yeah, that's so exciting for WeV8. I, I love that. You just with the network layer, you just have the dot slash path, and then the the WeV8 cloud service gives you your endpoint, and then you just plug it right back into the Gina flow. I, I love that part of it. And, and, and switching from the simple indexer to the WeV8 indexer is just use the other thing with okay. You need credentials <laughs> to also connect to the database. Obviously, yeah. the executor needs to connect, but th- mm-hmm. that's it somehow. So for, uh, when you develop locally, you can just try locally without uh, caring about your WeV8 cloud. And then in the moment you want to change, you just change. And when the indexer has the same interface. It just works. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. It's so exciting. And um, so so I thought that was a really great tour of the executor and flow. And I also just, for people listening, I highly recommend the um, intermediate bootcamp. Like that's just the latest thing that I was at with trying to get my own understanding. And it was super useful. The documentation is excellent for these kinds of things. So uh, the next thing I want to talk about is the Gina AI fine tuner. I really want to get into kind of maybe you could introduce it and then I could kind of th- give the particular things that I'm curious about. Okay, so I said earlier we had this problem that at some point we, um, uh, or how we do it, we, we try out to use Gina and mm-hmm. we see where we fail and then we improve there. Mm-hmm. And originally we thought, okay, the actual problem in solving neural search is not that the uh, model, getting a good model, but the problem is the old infrastructure. And I think this is true, but solving neural search has a lot of open problems. And we've, <laughs> we figured there are people that are able to fine tune their model, but a lot of people that have a business or problem or uh, want to create a startup or also already have a search, um, they don't have the resources to do all at the same time, to sp- spend researching a new ecosystem and uh, having a machine learning team to build their or mm-hmm. compute their own model. And um, we tried several um, our customers somehow to, to sell them Gina or somehow explain, oh, you please use them, not even sell, just let them use it. Mm-hmm. And we figured so much, uh, so often, actually they're not able to get the quality under control themselves. So because building up this knowledge takes time, takes resources, uh, so they can't just do it and it works. Um, and even for big companies, it's not trivial to do so. Um, and so we thought, okay, that's obviously the next construction site where we need to go and need to uh, do something. <laughs> and so we uh, invented the fine tuner uh, or uh, yeah, created this fine tuner. And um, <laughs> the idea was um, initially to be uh, somewhat agnostic to the systems, use PyTorch or TensorFlow and or Paddle Paddle, and then you somehow have your problem, you bring your data, and then you get a better model. So you, also you bring the model and then you get a better model. And I think the, the open source fine tuner is pretty cool and it's usable. Um, you haven't seen too much progress in the past two months, perhaps, because um, also during developing it, we also found, okay, it's nice, it's a nice tool. But uh, also in order to use it, you again need quite some knowledge how to use it because you need to understand how to configure it. It gives you all the tools mm-hmm. that you need, but you still need to understand how, how to use it. And it speeds up your progress, but still not enough to allow people that are really um, just have their business problem, they can already use it. So you still need quite some machine learning knowledge to use it uh, well and somehow uh, use it um, in, the, in the right way which a lot of people have. So for them, it's also, I think, a really cool tool, or also a time saver tool. But um, we figured, okay, actually, we need to develop it further, but we are not sure what is the exact right direction. And so we first said, okay, let's first develop in-house a little bit more, uh, continue developing it a little bit more to one or two specific needs that we have and not keep it a general purpose tool it was in, is in the open source version and uh, try to solve really one or two very specific problems with it. And then, uh, we're not yet sure what will be the next step. Perhaps we open source it again, perhaps not. Um, uh, might happen that we open source it then when we go further, but we didn't want to have this uh, development in the open. Because if we have, would have said, for example, oh, okay, we throw away 
two of the three frameworks and just mm -hmm. one, then someone would be unhappy. And we need to argue and we need to make mm -hmm. sure that um, we uh, meet the requirements. And we add a new feature. And, uh, and with Gina, we have added a lot of features in the past. And then at some point, we discovered, oh, we need to throw it away because it's actually not good and it stops our path further down the road. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, here we said, okay, let, let's inner source it. Let's, uh, for a moment, uh, keep it away from the community to not disturb ourselves. And then mm -hmm. let's see where we go. And it might be that we, uh, we de definitely uh, offer services around it. And potentially we open source it again at some point in time. Perhaps even soon. So it, this is not yet decided. But um, yeah, but the reason is not that we somehow want to inner source mm -hmm. it for keeping our knowledge, but for have some calmness in developing it further and really figuring out what we need there. Um, yeah. Yes, and yeah. so we, uh, I, I guess in the next two or three months, you will see some quite uh, exciting news around the fine tuner, which then Absolutely. again makes it really, really easy to, to use it. And uh, yeah, that's super exciting. And um, so, yeah, it sounds like such a there are so many parts with the fine tuning thing. I, I mean, I think the Taylor layer is extremely exciting. The, uh, you know, the, the idea of masking out parameters so that you're only fine tuning, say, 5 million parameters of a billion parameter model. And then that way it reduces the cost of doing so. And uh, I recently spoke with Jonathan Frankel from Mosaic ML on Composer and how they're implementing all sorts of things with this kind of model augmentation to do that kind of efficient fine tuning. And so then one other part of the puzzle that I see is, say, the data labeling. And so I'm kind of curious, like, um, and then and then there's also for people to get a full picture of this fine tuning uh, ecosystem. There is also the the hard negative mining. There's particular loss functions like triplet losses, or maybe you have some kind of contrastive learning objective that are different from uh, like cross entropy y minus y hat that kind of thing. So that, so there are a few different things with it. And one thing I really wanted to talk to you more about and get your thoughts on is the data labeling thing. How and Han had mentioned that, um, say, with um, Amazon Mechanical Turk, people are get pretty good at labeling data, but you still need to have a, a good interface to, to, show, to show them how to label the data to, you know, what, are, what is this about, really? Have you thought about the data labeling kind of software space and how that ties into this particular problem of similarity labeling? Yes. So uh, if you have followed the progress in the fine tuner, you have, uh, there was a labeler at some point and mm -hmm. we took it out again. Um, and you might wonder why. And the, the simple answer is it was not, uh, the quality was not good enough for us that we want to keep it. So we didn't felt like uh, good enough to keep it there. And uh, it was not yet the tool that we envision. And so um, there are other labelers out there that are also more or less specific to um, fine tuning search problems, but none of them really convinces me. So, and uh, so I still see the problem there. So there is an open field. So if you, if you, if someone in the community knows a good labeler where they think, okay, this nails search labeling, please put it in the comments of the show, because I want to know where <laughs> I want to have the same synergy as with VV8, because it would be great to, um, uh, get this off our shoulders, but um, this is not, still, but for, uh, still not a good. There is no good tool. Uh, at least I have not found a good tool, and um, so this is definitely needed. So uh, if this there is no good tool in three to six months, yes, I guess we will take this challenge again, <laughs> and we'll try to build a really good tool because um, this is needed. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna re uh, recommend. And perhaps perhaps uh, let let me explain why it is so hard for search. Because in Zalando, actually, uh, so I worked before with Zalando, similar as Han, and um, there we had a labeling tool in house, and this was actually great, but sadly not open source in this case. And so because for search labeling, um, in the end you want to have when you have a query and you have let's say ten thousand documents in your catalog, you want to say which of these ten thousand documents are good. Um, so. What you need, you need to see for one query a lot of answers, perhaps not all 10,000, but at least the top 100 from whatever is your search metric, and then start labeling them. But over time, you, uh, when you have, uh, it might be that you miss some down the road, some of the, some doc label some documents in, in the long tail. That's also totally fine. But um, when you go mm. then and search and, and change your, your search engine, then it might be that some in the long tail turn up to be in the top results. Um, and then you actually need to label them again. So I think labeling is for one, a tool that you need, but also to figure out the right process to do the labeling in a way that you can get to measure the right things. Because mm -hmm. if you miss something in the long tail and uh, another algorithm picks them up and puts them at the top righteously, 
but you mm -hmm. never label them, you will never not measure it. And actually you might see, oh, this algorithm does not perform so good because some things that you labeled initially, mm -hmm. but might be not as good, uh, uh, went a little bit down. And so <laughs> labeling in search is an extensive task, but also it's a task that where you need to understand how you do this um, progressively and, and yeah. One more thing there, and uh, once you label somehow, when you, when you have this long tail, and once you start labeling again some uh, things in long tail, and then you evaluate again, you also must evaluate your first algorithm again against the same data set. Mm -hmm. So this is again a, a more um, operational problem than a labeling problem itself. So um, you, you label your data set over time, it gets better. So your data set is also not something that you just have static, which people from that come out of the science world, they have the data set, it's static. You won't touch it again. Mm -hmm. Someone have, has done this data set and it's perfect. But no, I think when you have a live problem, a real problem that you want to solve, um, you will have had, not have the chance to label it thoroughly. But you, you need to iteratively label to really measure your, your algorithms. And this is, um, yeah, as I said, more uh, operational problem than a front-end tool problem. Hmm. Could you, um, what the long tail thing, could you help me understand that? A little, does that refer to maybe you've asked a very bizarre question and it's long tail in the distribution space of the queries that it sees? Or is it, say, long tail in that um, you ask a question and most of, the, say, it's you ask a question where there's new information and most of the return documents are that old information. And then, you know, maybe on result like 73, it's found that new information and that's maybe the long tail. Or can you help me just understand no, okay, this yeah, idea yeah, of long tail? Okay. We had before the um, quest, open domain question answering. And so <laughs> imagine you have now 10 documents which you want to search, and in total they have each a thousand sentences, so you have a thousand sentences that could be the right answer. And now I have a question, whatever it is. Think about it, any question. That, do you have a good question that we can play around with? <laughs> um, I, I like thinking about like who won the NBA championship because it requires updating the information and then it requires also that reasoning about understanding the year. So. You say who won the NBA championship in 2022, particularly? I love it. I love it. Okay, and, uh, let's say who won the NBA, uh, the last NBA championship. That might be the, the question mm -hmm. that actually right. is really, yeah. <laughs> because it requires a context. Mm -hmm. So, and uh, you label it the first time, and then listen, uh, and you can't go to uh, 10,000 uh, sentences. So mm -hmm. you need to somehow label just some sentences. So what you usually do there is you have some search system. It just gives you answers, and you go to the top 50 answers, and you label them. And now you have this question, and you may see, oh, uh, in this year, this and this, uh, OK, this is kind of relevant, perhaps not perfect relevancy. So you usually do not relevant, kind of relevant, super relevant, or even more fine-grained, um, some more labels. And yeah, they might say, yeah, OK, this is kind of relevant, but not the perfect relevance. And then you label this, uh, and um, yeah, you do this. But you don't get the perfect. So the last in the top 50, the last year was not in there. And um, so now you may tune your algorithm, and then it's, uh, and the, the right answer is somewhere at uh, position 280. And now you tune your algorithm, and out of a sudden, the right answer is at position 9. <laughs> and now you need to go there and, uh, and somehow see again, OK, the right answer is actually bubbled up. And somehow, now I need to say, OK, 9 is good. So 9 is much better than, than 280. Um, or per, that also heavily depends on your search problem. So if Google puts the right answer on place nine, you might not be happy. If your e-commerce search platform uh, puts the right answer on uh, the right product on place nine, which is really the right fit, that might be totally fine because you anyhow see nine products at the thing and you can Im with the image process much faster. So um, how much of the, you have to reevaluate from these answers to, in order to also give credit to the new model that actually answered this question much better, uh, very much also depends on your search system. So in an e-commerce search, you might always um, re-label all answers until place 9 or 18 or 15 or whatever it is for your mm -hmm. platform. But for mm -hmm. Google, you might say, oh, no, only the top three re are relevant. So I only need to re-label the top three because when my new search engine puts it at place 4, it's, it's still bad. And um, yeah, so but this is also again operational. So you need to understand um, this is your, your your system, and and this is my problem. And um, how do I do the relabeling? And so I think this the, for this labeling, we need to better understand how to um, first solve some very specific problems, and then generalize it to provide a tool that actually different people can use. And um, so. 
so I see kind of two layers of which you could do this fine tuning. You could try to say you have some massive model trained with contrastive learning on a massive data set and that produces your initial embeddings. You can maybe try to fine tune that to adapt it to your da data domain. Or you could have, say, a re-ranking layer after that in which you have a few options. Like you could have a pairwise encoder that takes two inputs at a time and ranks them like that. Or you could have uh, maybe a mapping from the embedding vectors into a new embedding vector space. Or maybe you could stack them <laughs> and predict the rank order with the softmax labeling. Yep. And <laughs> now I ask you another question. So how do I evaluate now the first model? <laughs> So I can evaluate both models mm. together because I want to, my mm. final result is good or bad. But now I just want to train my first model and fine-tune both models separately. But I want mm -hmm. to fine-tune the first model. Um, when does it get better? It gets mm -hmm. better when the second model can really digest, digest it. So mm. uh, it's not even clear if you want to label just be after the first model or to get better training data how to do it somehow how, how to make it better because uh, it's not clear if, if some uh, relevant questions bubble up the second mm -hmm. model will perform better or worse or it might be that it um, bubbles the right one up but also some really disturbing answers uh, which disturbs the second model bubbles it also up and then the second model performs out of a sudden worse even so the first model in average performed better and so um, then the evaluation again um, sure you want to evaluate the whole system but uh, so f if you just want to evaluate you can create your evaluation data set and that's fine but if you want to train for a second system, again, you know what is your result, what you want to train for. But I have no clue how to, or it's not trivial and obvious how to define the training uh, paradigm for the first question. But come back to your question. Yes, uh, fine tuning the second model at some point is also really important because it's re-ranking, especially in um, search questions where the first answer must be right is super important. This is an absolutely fascinating point you bring up. And I'm a huge fan of uh, like Michael Bronstein and their work on graph neural networks and geometric deep learning. And this idea that if you if you have a graph neural network architecture prior and you're re-ranker, it'll be invariant to the rank order that your first embedding model has produced. And that way you don't have these propagating errors where uh, your re-ranker might be used to this certain, like because it has the prior of looking at it as these this stack of vector embeddings. And so I think... Um, but this holds only true if your first model provides you the same set of 500 answers. The answer, the order of the first 500 is, is irrelevant. But if you're out of a sudden from the 500, 250 go out of the set and 250 new come in, then the graph neural network mm -hmm. model will still give you different results. Or am I mistaken here? Uh, I think it would be... I think it would be... It would treat it as a set, right? So it would... Um, I was... So if um so if you if you fine tune your embedding model, and you get a different two hundred fifty, I think the the general idea of the graph neural network would be to make it less fit, less biased to towards the initial ranked list. So as the embedding model changes, it doesn't propagate the errors into the re ranker as heavily as if it has this prior of uh, the initial rank order and sort of probably biasing itself to predicting it that way. But I guess there are things like in Transformers, how they have that um, position encoding, like where you um, give it the signal of left to right in text sequences. You could probably add that kind of prior. And maybe, so maybe if you cook in that kind of embedding in the input layer, then you would still have that problem. Maybe something like that. It's just kind of something I'm thinking about as, as you're uh, telling me about this problem. But to, to that, be honest, I, I have not looked into graph embeddings too much. So uh, I, uh, I have a hard time answering or give, giving better insights there. <laughs> So I'm yeah. sorry for this. <laughs> I, th I think like the key thing is like the the bias in like a convolution is like the answer is locally structured sort of, and then you mm -hmm. bubble up the local structure. And I think the transformers of the graph neural networks are more like global kind of prior. But yeah, it's a fascinating thing. And definitely I think graph neural networks are on that like cutting edge of thing where I'm like, do I want to use this? Is it uh, mature enough where I... I'm going to have a good understanding of how it fails, but all that kind of stuff. So it's a super interesting topic, um, fine tuning, labeling, all the different parts of fine tuning in search systems or fine tuning your embedding model, your re-ranking, or maybe the downstream question answering functionality. Uh, can you tell me a little more about uh, particular experiences at uh, Zalando? And I'd love to hear about the story of how uh, you and Han met and uh, came to be working <laughs> together at Gina as well. 
Yeah, so and, uh, I worked some time in Zalando, then uh, I was uh, asked, oh, do you want to join the search team? It was a new team founded, somehow they should restructure the search, build it from an old monolith to microservice architecture, which sounds great until you do it. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> yeah, then I joined the search team and uh, actually the first day I came there, Han was not there. So I took a place and just sat in, the, in his place because none other was free. And then, but some days later, he, he somehow, uh, uh, yeah, I, I then left my uh, Han spot and we said somehow Han, Nan and me sit all in a row, which is kind of funny. So they are now CEO and CTO of uh, Gina and uh, yeah, life happened. And now I'm also here <laughs> and um, there we, um, Han had this vision of this neural search already. And uh, in the beginning, I, I was pretty skeptical because um, I have before worked in the pricing department and I have seen bringing machine learning life um, needs a lot of knowledge of the problem. So uh, getting the model right, okay, yes, the model must be good. Otherwise it will <laughs> fail definitely, but it's not the... Um, perhaps not the hardest part because getting the model right, once you have formulated your problem, you, you can do it somehow. This is, uh, uh, there are people that are smart enough that can solve this problem. But um, understanding how to actually solve search uh, turned out, or in general, how to solve a business problem, in my opinion, is often the, the harder part because there might be um, requirements which you don't see. So for um, there's always a CTO with their most loved question. And this should be right answered. If you fail, your model can be perfect. If it fails this one question, the CTO will hate your model. So and <laughs> then you need to somehow build around, perhaps around your model, uh, um, kind of a safety net, which helps you to um, filter out the bad results or uh, keep good results that you uh, developed over time, uh, which is completely unrelated to machine learning. So it's just an engineering mm -hmm. task that you build around your model. And um, so, but uh, after some time, Han then uh, convinced me, okay, this might be in, uh, somewhat doing this neural search with vectors with embedded might be a really uh, cool thing to do and going away from the traditional search pipelines um, and uh, but th then two other guys implemented it also put into production and I came to this team only later so I can only in retrospect uh, say what they did and the problem is Han left Zalando and someone else took it over and um, it's always when someone completely leaves before having a proper handover, which took some time and someone else really onboarded the code, there's always, uh, the code is always dropped. And then this other person also left. So what they did in the, in the search team is they, they said, okay, let's, let's try it again and let's do it super simple. We don't do any multi-layer. We just do a one hot encoding of uh, all our products, of all our queries. That worked pretty well uh, to a certain uh, degree and um, was in the end a very simple approach to the problem. Um, just having this one hot encoding, which so Zalando has a massive amount of data, so we could yeah, mm -hmm. just use a massive amount of data, train it, and then it was good. <laughs> oh, it was uh, yeah, well, it was I would say it was kind of good, um, and also mm -hmm. was used in production, and we could see okay, we actually improve um, on different KPIs. <laughs> give, give me a second to uh, gather my thoughts. <laughs> um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, what I figured out there um, is that uh, how we then put it into production was in the end, there was no model in production. There was no no fancy, there was a lookup table that was pre-generated, which mm -hmm. uh, somehow um, back in the days was the easiest way <laughs> to integrate it in the running system and then to build some trust that actually we, we could provide value. And then only after we... Uh, and which is when you, when you think about how Gina does neural search, it's always full system, full pipeline. Um, mm -hmm. But back then there was nothing like Gina. There was just, we had to build everything ourselves. And then the easiest way was just, okay, build the lookup table and provide uh, answers for certain questions where we said, okay, we, for these 300,000 queries, we have pre-generated results, which we can look up and, and give the users. And um, then again, uh, it was interesting to see, okay, how do we do training there? So we trained purely on click data and now fashion is a really um, seasonal thing. So in, in fashion, mm. you have uh, every season new items and uh, the season switches. And so on, on which data do you train? Mm -hmm. And we wanted to, uh, you could train on all the data in the past. That was too much. And then you also have the really old data in there, which is kind of, uh, <laughs> mm. may not give you too much insight because it might maybe trends that don't exist anymore. So um, it's hard. Then you can't do just the four, last four weeks because when you just train on the last four weeks, you have the problem that um, when you have a season switch, you don't have the old season in your training data. So you can't answer any new questions about the new season. Mm -hmm. So we came to, okay, a good thing is just take one year and you have a full season cycle somehow inside mm -hmm. your training data. 
which uh, yeah, and then but then the training data was quite big and it came to ML ops problems, which was not really machine learning, but rather okay, how can I put the data there and and um, do several training runs and uh, save my data um, and again <laughs> rather operational than just the, the the pure machine learning magic was not not so magic, but uh, the <laughs> getting it running and getting the engineering behind it done was uh, often the the real challenge. That's super interesting and. Um... So I think so. A couple of things, and uh, so one thing I wanted to maybe unpack is um, is maybe is it this idea of sort of like a test time calibration layer that you were describing earlier, like uh, like an ensembling, and then you kind of have um, multiple ways of maybe when you have a test query, you map it to a few different train queries. So so like if you have a um, uh, frequently asked question template, the the problem is about taking a new query and trying to find the most similar query that you already have. Is that kind of the one of the architectures you're describing? This is was yeah. This was exactly this uh, long, uh, uh, long document question answering. Exactly that. Some exactly you do this lookup table in uh, prepared questions. Mm -hmm. That's super cool. And hearing all that, all these uh, different components of it is so interesting. And so I'm curious, like um, currently, do you have like an application that guides most of your development, or is it about mostly just like kind of being a master of, of a bunch of things and going in and out and seeing how it m changes the overall like holistic view of it. Yes, we actually have some, some clients that somehow guides our uh, development and somehow <laughs> uh, come always with new challenges that, that helps us some uh, understand uh, where should we go. Um, so that's very helpful because they don't have our uh, our own goodwill. Somehow, obviously, mm -hmm. they, they have their requirements and they're not just, okay, I can keep a blind eye on this floor. So that, that's obviously pretty good. But um, internally, we have, <laughs> when you go to our documentation page, you have the, a bot at the bottom, a Slack uh, chatbot, um, which uh, we can push a, put a question and then you get a directly jump in the documentation to the right place. And... Um, this is something that we need to know uh, or that we use in order to test our own deployment, our uh, own um, auto uh, NLP skills somehow uh, develop this further. And um, this might become a product uh, at some point in time. Uh, but for now, it's mostly to in order to, to test ourselves. So exactly what you just said, mm -hmm. we need to understand how, how we do things. And so this is one thing. We have um, one more um, image-related uh, project, which uh, we may announce pretty soon, but I don't, don't want to talk about this. Oh, mm -hmm. too concrete, but there we did a lot of research on how can we actually do text-to-image and image-to-image -image search uh, with better quality. And there we heavily mm -hmm. used the fine-tuner and understood, okay, this is how we configure this tool correctly in order to get real uh, or quality that that really impresses us and that we like mm -hmm. and that is better than the pure clip uh, the default clip model um, mm -hmm. yeah and as I said we have some some other also with other modalities um, from from customers uh, where I can't really talk about <laughs> I'm sorry <laughs> is um is in the multimodal space and I love how Gina has this kind of thing where you can add the text and images is very uh, natively integrated, how you, in the document mm -hmm. object, you have dot text and dot tensor to put the image. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think about other kinds of multimodal fusions and generally, is this yeah. one of the core motivations? So what works surprisingly well is uh, 3D models. So uh, when you have 3D models of any kind, uh, which you have, I mean, every computer game is full of 3D models. Every mm -hmm. film that you watch is, uh, for a movie that you watch is full of computer, uh, of 3D and uh, models. And um, in the moment you have some rich uh, or at least a little bit of metadata to them um, or to some of them, mustn't even be for all, but for some of them, um, this is pretty easy to train because it's, uh, it's very restructured. You have uh, which models can pick up well. Um, so I would say 3D models is actually something um, where, where I don't see yet that people come up with a ton of problems. But I believe in the moment people come up with problems, we can actually solve this pretty well with neural search. So hmm. um, we have seen some, and uh, they're really promising. And um, so if there are people in the audience that have a 3D model uh, search hmm. in mind, where they say, oh, I have here this application, then please use neural search or try neural search, because hmm. there you will have a lot of success really in short time. Um, yeah, I, I guess for um, video, you have the problem that videos are so rich that we need to refine our um, understanding of neural search. So currently, it's often uh, <laughs> one query vector to one result vector. 
But if you have a video and you just have one vector for your video, that obviously doesn't work because if, even a 10 second video, there might be driving a car in the background, there might be a dog barking, there might be someone shouting, mm -hmm. there might be some, some overlay. So there's so much information in a video that you can't just say, this is mm -hmm. the one thing that we, this, this video is about. So there, um, I think the, the research is also developing the direction that you have these um, multi embeddings for one document where you somehow say, okay, this is my, my video and now I get uh, 10 embeddings out of it. And then mm -hmm. these embeddings somehow focus on different um, parts of the video or somehow, uh, and this, uh, I'm not sure how they're named, but there are new models where you also don't say, okay, please, this embedding focus on audio, this on text, but they mm -hmm. automatically give you somehow the um, multiple embeddings. And there, I believe the research is not yet far enough that this will go into uh, mm -hmm. broad production. Might be that Google uses it. Okay, fair enough. But uh, uh, in, in the broad production, but it's uh, also I see some development there. And I found this this multi embedding um, idea very fascinating because it um, is naturally the next step. If, if you, also, if you have a sentence, but then the sentence is about two different things. And sometimes mm -hmm. uh, when you search, this one thing is really important. And sometimes when you search, the other thing is really important. And perhaps it's mm -hmm. a bad idea to have just one embedding for these two topics, but rather you need a technique mm -hmm. to have two embeddings, but then also to combine them in the right way. And um, these techniques uh, developing this, um, I see uh, quite some potential in the future. Yeah, but, yeah. but even for, for, for just, sorry, sorry for interrupting, no even worries. for just somehow uh, fashion search, because I come from Zalando, I mean, if you if you search for take my shirt, you can say, okay, it's a floral shirt, so the embeddings can can focus on so many different uh, parts, under the arms, okay, it's a little bit uh, looser under the arms, or it has v-neck, or whatever it has, so it has so many things that you can uh, look at detail at, and when you search for it that you might care about, that uh, one embedding... Um, I, I'm curious if we, we see there some development. This, yeah, which comes back to your segmenting. So uh, <laughs> you are <laughs> segmenting. This is this is like a segmenter, right? You you have your uh, mm -hmm. just in a different perception. You have your one your mm -hmm. document, and you have different segments inside this document that you then want to encode. Or yeah, yeah, that's fascinating. Maybe like a generative model that can add some context to the query and and have a few different ways, so you can have that kind of like ensemble of different ways of forming and embedding of a query. And I also really thought that was super interesting what you're saying about uh, 3D objects because it has that like depth information that's so important about our visual world. Whereas uh, videos, they yeah, and they're very noisy with all the things that could be in the background, the audio, and and they but they're still 2D slices even though they have that kind of motion and time prior that the that the th the 3D images don't capture. But uh, could could you give me a couple examples of 3D? Is it like you know like point clouds from LIDAR scans is that, and maybe like MRIs, I think are naturally 3D and, and games. Are these are kind of mostly the things that you're looking at or something yeah. else? <laughs> so you nailed it. <laughs> no, it's, <laughs> yes, it's really, uh, I think, um, so um, we haven't looked yet at laser scans, but I think there it's really promising because, um, mm -hmm. I mean, you need also some pre-processing. You have a laser scan, you might have, uh, I don't know, several million points, mm -hmm. uh, but then you need to segment them again also in the search query. So there, out of a sudden, mm -hmm. you have laser scan. I want to identify, okay, which is which object here. And But your catalog mm -hmm. might actually be just uh, whatever are the objects. Let's say a house, I have a catalog of shelves, of, of desk, of different chairs. And now I have my 3D scan and I want to have a 3D model with exactly the right pieces. Then we change somehow the paradigm between what is query or somehow the size of information in a query and in the result. So whereas in e-commerce or wherever you have a lot of information about the product, but the query mm -hmm. has three words, out of a sudden, you just have this one share, but your query uh, is huge and you need to first segment down your query and then answer like uh, multiple of uh, queries inside one query. So um, there are... Uh, I believe uh, the, the identifying of the object itself, once you segmented your uh, 3D scan correctly, mm -hmm. is kind of easy, kind of easy. Mm -hmm. But the segmenting itself might be perhaps also easy. I don't know. <laughs> but yes, yeah, the, uh, 3D scans is one thing. Then the second thing is um, that we see is uh, exactly 3D models in, in games, in whatever in movies, uh, where you have just a database of 3D models. And there it's also uh, when you want to then build your game and you have a character, you want a similar character because it's a brother of the other character. They should look similar. So then get another character which looks similar or things like this. I think there it's... Mm -hmm. um, 
Uh, yeah, it's, a, it's just hidden. amazing. The um, the I see it kind of as VVA and Gina AI. In addition to kind of looking at the search application, where it's kind of building like the data structure layer as well for these multimodal objects. And you think about say vision based robotics, where what they're trying to do now is they're trying to have they're trying to bring like the success of transfer learning to robotics, where they want to have the success of GPT three kind of adapt to any domain. They want to see that happen in robotics and. Uh, what Maximilian is describing this, having these, say, LIDAR scans that create these 3D point clouds of the scenes. And then, I mean, you'd also need a video of that, right? It'd be four, it'd be four dimensional even, right? You'd have the uh, the time axis of the mm -hmm. frames as you do these scans. But the richness of that data and putting it into data structures like the Gina AI doc array and how it makes it so clear how to structure multimodal data where you have your... Uh, you know, you could have the 3D data, the video, or 4D data with the video with the point clouds as well. And you could also have text descriptions of what the robot's doing. Maybe you have meta tags like, um, you know, this video was collected inside of a lab in Berkeley and the lighting was this. Whatever meta symbolic tags you want to put on. But this is like the data structure for putting unstructured kind of multimodal data together. And then you got the WeVA database putting together these indexes for efficient search through absolutely massive collections of vectors as we see things like billion scale similarity searches and all of this is just so exciting so i really enjoyed all of this uh talking about all these topics maximilian it's super exciting this field of uh neural search and i think just so much exciting technology is being built so thank you so much for uh for being on the podcast if there's uh maybe anything you want to uh, conclude with that i might have missed on no, I think you, you nailed it pretty much. So uh, the purpose of this, uh, understanding how to really get the quality up and uh, is, is, is some exciting topic for the future from the operational and from the uh, tuning itself perspective. Yeah, yeah definitely. And, thanks and for, I really thanks hope so much for are. having me here. <laughs> it was really a pleasure somehow uh, talking about uh, Gina and uh, my view on neural search itself. So yeah, thanks a lot <laughs> for having me. And thank you so much. And I really hope you'll be interested in coming back on the podcast to uh, share further how your understanding is developing with all these things and just super excited. Absolutely. So thanks again. Awesome. Super Bye -bye. cool. Yeah.